practice. Michael Healy is standing by to be your voice and to um, bring your comments and questions into the workshop. And you can try it out. Um, hopefully you can find it. It should say questions. And then you type into one of the boxes and hit something like submit to staff. And that's all it takes. We encourage you to do that during the session. And um, why don't we get started? So Bentley, would you hit record and launch? The recording has started. All righty. Um, welcome to the Linking to Members online C-Build workshop. Um, Bentley, Lean. Michael Healy and I, uh, and this is Mark Oring, we're going to be um, presenting. And um, Michael, would you say hi so people can hear your voice? Hey, everybody. This is Michael Healy. I'm here in Burlington, Vermont, checking in with you this evening. Thanks for being oh, here. Oh, nice. Yeah. And Bentley, would you just uh, introduce yourself and then start us up? Sure. This is Bentley Lean, and I'm in uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin. I'm kind of a muggy evening here. And, and running the slides. So there you go, Mark. OK. Um, and Bentley, I think you're, unless I didn't read the agenda right, I think you're starting. Oh, this is the C-Build program overview, Mark. Oh, you want me to do that? Sure. So the um, today's workshop is one of our online recorded workshops that is part, it's one of the five features of the CBIL program. Um, uh, the other parts are uh, field guides, which are kind of one-page topic-based um, uh, resources uh, at your disposal in the CBIL library. We also are doing um, eight or nine CBO 101 sessions a year. That's an in-person session mainly designed for newly elected directors, but um, long Long-term directors and managers are also welcome and have said it's a great opportunity. And we have two coming up, one in Ann Arbor, uh, I think July 11th or 12th, whichever is a Saturday, and one in the Twin Cities um, in September, September 12th. And then the next ones will start over in January. We also come to your place and do a retreat. And we talk to the board leader and uh, other people on the board uh, during the year as part of the hours. That link there, it's on the screen at the bottom, uh, to our library is where we keep um, all of our resources and we, we add to it um, pretty often. So we encourage you to go there and take advantage. Um, and let's see, we have, um, I think, two or three online workshops coming up. Um, and the Seabuild News is the place to find out what they are and when they are. Um, so, Bentley, how about that? That was excellent, Mark. Thank you very much. All right. Well, okay. Um, getting us started, we've got some uh, objectives tonight. What we're hoping to get through, and we hope you can take away tonight, is uh, um, we want to build a theoretical framework for member linkage. Um, we're going to talk about two models um, to think about our members and our organizations. Um, and we want to spend some time thinking about uh, connecting existing cost systems for member linkage and communication planning uh, to these models. Uh, and uh, then have some time to talk about uh, ideas for using tools effectively. And I think what's going to make this m most uh, fulfilling for all those listening here and actually help those that listen later is if we truly do engage in uh, uh, questions. Get your questions out there all uh, um, as we go along, and we'll we'll fit them in. And I'm going to add in a couple more ob objectives, and I and I think one of them is that we uh, all relax around this area of linkage. I think a lot of uh, tension around this issue, and uh, I hope we can all just kind of breathe into this. And by the end of our conversation, we come to a recognition that uh, less is more, or less can be more. Um, Michael or Mark, you want to add anything there? I'm with you. I'm ready to roll. Okay. Okay. So it's always good to start in the beginning. So uh, <laughs> I want to get us started there. Um, but uh, okay. 
if we don't, if we don't go, go quite back that far, um, what I'd like us to spend some time thinking about is reflecting about how any organization starts. Um, it's a group of people with, a, with a, um, a certain tension between the way the world is and the world way they'd like to see it. Um, and uh, we start a process in, in most cases. But I'm going to fill that out in the next couple of slides. If we think about uh, our heritage and the co-op movement, it, we can trace it all the way back to these guys. This was the small group of people thinking and acting about uh, uh, conditions as they saw them. And they became the root of our movement. And, and, and if, the, if your board isn't familiar with this history, I think it's something that's very worthwhile to become familiar with, um, to get grounded in, in the, the struggles that these people face. And I think if we can kind of keep not the actual struggles, but the process of um, um, reflecting on issues, um, um, taking action, and then refining those issues and rolling through time. That's a theme that's going to come up ag again and again. Um, these, these people were, meeting, uh, were acting in 1844, and a lot of them really inspired by the work of Robert, Robert Owen um, that founded the first uh, co-op, the, the Rochdale Pioneers uh, on Toad Lane. And they spent a lot of time uh, thinking about issues facing them and trying to come up with a way to take control of their lives and feel self-empowered. Um, and it's a, it's a history well worth knowing. Um, now, these guys, if you were at CCMA, you may even recognize some of these people uh, from that event. Um, because if we, if we go back and think of our own organizations, and I often think about my own co-op here in La Crosse, it's a, it's a group of people uh, seeing the world, learning about something, taking action, and then asking others to join them and seeking some uh, alignment with those people. And you can think about this issue of linkage is the very act of joining with them uh, is part of that, that, uh, that linkage. And I think if you think about your own co-op, you'll find a very similar story. Um, uh, people seeing the world as it is, uh, learning about something, trying to figure out a way to, to, to bring um, whatever their utopian view of the world in, into reality, and then cycling through time. Okay. Okay. So how do they do this? They do this by acting like leaders. Okay. It's a small group, uh, thinking and learning, making decisions, in our, our case, uh, monitoring, evaluating, and, and revising, and asking others to join, and, and uh, trying to listen deeply to those people. And that's what we're going to be going through uh, talking about as we go forward here. Um, and at all times, at, at the board level, really working to, to learn new information and, and gain knowledge and wisdom around those conditions. Okay. And, uh, um, Michael, anything to add there? Um, well, I think this is what we're doing here is really laying out the basis of what's coming next, which is that uh, boards are in a leadership position and that the, that's been true throughout the history of the world and the history of co-ops is that it's small groups of people who can make some decisions that really influence uh, the future, uh, the world that we're going to live in. And so we're going to try to now lay out some ways that boards can do that uh, in our own very special world of food co-ops. Okay. okay. So, um, Mark, why is this important? Why is this important? And, and the, the point is um, that change happens. And if we're going to um, be involved in that change, and influence the change uh, to our desired outcomes, we really need leadership. And uh, we can look back. I mean, there's, there's uh, so many ways that we can, we can affirm that change is part of our, our lives and our businesses. Um, but one way is to just take a minute and look at 
co-op history. And if you go on to the the next um, the next slide there, Bentley, we'll take a look at um, not in great detail, but this this is a picture that that we include in the CBL 101 reader, and we introduce to um, newly elected directors and uh, the the two the two lines that start at the far left. This is a, a timeline from 1930 until um, uh, present, say, and and the the pink and the blue line to the left that go up and then down. Those are co-ops, uh, both consumer co-ops and wholesale distributors that started up out of the depression, uh, known as the the old wave of, of co-ops in the U.S. And then kind of in the middle, there's a, a green line that's going kind of straight up and then then pretty steeply down. And that's uh, starting in the, uh, in the 60s um, and is natural food co-ops uh, peaking at around 700 and then kind of uh, going down to 250 or so. Um, and, you know, when we see that, that co-ops come and go, uh, of course, they come and go for a lot of reasons, but, but you know, generally, uh, one thing, you know, to think about might be relevance in the marketplace. Um, there are plenty of stories about natural food co-ops starting up without good business practices, but we certainly know a lot about running uh, successful businesses now. The question would be, you know, are we really, um, are we able to understand you know how our co-ops are relevant and going to be relevant for the next 20 years. Um, so this picture is really to to really present that what we have now might not hold, and somebody needs to be really thinking about the future. And, and managers are really going to be doing a great job of doing the business planning for the future of our co-ops. And what we're going to be talking about today is boards really taking that leadership position to be thinking and 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 acting in a way that will help guide the, the overall organization and, and be hopefully making our cops relevant for the, for the future. So let's go on, um, Bentley, to that the next slide. Um, hey, as, you're, as you're going ahead, I just want to remind people that if they have questions about anything that you're showing there, they can use yeah. the question uh, tool. And if, you want a, and if you want a close-up look at that slide, the this whole um, package is a PDF file in the CBUILD library, um, and it's also in the CBL 101 reader. But what's kind of interesting is to take this leadership position connected to um, what Bentley was talking about there, about the Rochdale Pioneers, and really say, um, how are we like them? So how are board members of today's uh, co-ops like the Rochdale Pioneers? You know how how much of that type of pioneering spirit and leadership spirit are we actually taking on? And you know, right here we're saying boards should act like leaders. Um, I'd be curious. We could do a little experiment with. Uh, um, I think that uh, attendees can click uh, raise your hand button on your toolbar there somewhere. This would be uh, uncharted territory. We've never done that. But I wonder how many of you uh, feel like you're a leader. And if you can find that button, uh, go for it. All right. All right. Here we got some hands coming up. Thanks. Thanks so much. Some, some folks have to think about it a little bit. Yeah. All right. Very good. Um, you know, boards are in. Uh, uh, move the slides one, one forward, uh, Bentley. Um, so boards have been empowered by the members to be leaders. This is our uh, empowerment uh, and accountability chart. And uh, you have already been given permission to, uh, and, and, and authorization to act on behalf of the members and to be stewards of the organization. And uh, we would like to encourage you to take that uh, authority seriously and to feel compelled to ask good strategic questions about what that means for, uh, you know, what, what it means to be guiding your co-op uh, into the future. And uh, Bentley, if you could move on to the next one. We have this chart that um, 
that that we use that's you know showing that a uh, board will have policies that's the little box in the, the, the bottom center of that chart and then coming off of having policies and and you might say that the policies what they represent is that you have a way of of providing accountability within the organization and once you feel like you have that in place you can really pursue this question of wow what's going on in the world and how does our organization relate to changes and dynamics and member needs and what's going on and you are already in the strong position to be uh, asking those questions yourselves and taking the leadership position in the discovery of, of what that leads to and inviting people into the conversation whenever you think that would be appropriate. Um, so this is a this is kind of a cycle that we um, that, that that how we demonstrate a board can commit to you know quote building wisdom and knowledge unquote and that that actually is an essential part of of, um, of board leadership. And Mark, here's a question that just came in, and I think it relates to your statement of inviting people into the conversation. So uh -huh. David's asking. Um, when, what happens when there's ineffective member linkage? So if a board is perceived as dictating policy, what do you think that's about? If a board is perceived as dictating policy, well, I mean, you've been authorized to have policy. And you know, so what, what I think we're going to be talking about uh, tonight is you, you know, and we're, we're, we're you know, repeating this, this concept of taking leadership position in, and, and, and driving conversations forward, uh, not only in your membership, but out into the broader community. And in, in my mind, if what, what you're doing is you're checking, you know, as you are public with your process, if you are, you know, talking about stuff that is just not resonating in your membership and in the community, I think you'll find out. You'll, you'll hear that's like, what are you guys doing? Why are you talking about this? Um, and and yet, you know, I would go ahead and try it and see, <laughs> and not worry about. Well, gee, maybe we'll hear that. I would I would let that happen and then and then respond and, and check. But there are so many things going on uh, right now in the world that really are worthy of exploration by board leadership. That um, I really wouldn't I wouldn't feel constrained with this idea of driving the conversation. Dictating policy is a you know is a little different because I think, you know, you're in the you're in the your job is to have policies and no one else it's no one else's job to do that. So um, uh, you know we may need to explore that further, David, to, to get in deeply to, to what you're after there. But I would say, you know, you have to be the authorized body to have policies and you know you you could be uh, um, called a, dic dic a dictator of policy, <laughs> appropriately. <laughs> dictator of policy, that's a nice title for you. <laughs> Let's try not to build on that, though. <laughs> um, so, um, Bentley, I wonder if you would uh, take us into this idea of how how members are engaged in the co-op. You know, so we've kind of we've kind of started a case for boards taking the leadership position and now it seems like what we need to do is is see um, you know how do members fit into the organization and and um, how do we how do we view their roles yeah and it might be a transition to, to David's question as well you know the very question um, you, you know what happens when there's ineffective member linkage if a board is, per is perceived as dictating policy you know it raises the question perceived by whom and um, you, you know, and how do you how do you judge? I, I mean, it can be a political statement to accuse a board of, of being dictatorial and whatnot. But what, who's giving voice to that idea? And how do we differentiate them from all of our members? And um, Marilyn Scholl has done some some uh, nice writing and some work in trying to help us think about you know what are what are our members' needs and what are our members' motivations. And, and, uh, and there's a, a link to an article that she wrote, and there's actually a full uh, webinar on this question. Um, um, but I, I think it's uh, helpful to look at, and I think it can be enlightening, and I think it, 
it's uh, helpful to have some model upon which to think about all of uh, all of the, the members of our organization. What kind of mental map do we create when, when thinking about who is uh, concerns to consider and how to consider them? Um, uh, and Mas Abraham Maslow has developed uh, a, a model to think about this in terms of um, the hierarchy of needs. And, and Maryland's taken it to uh, COPS. But there's other models, too. I think the, the bottom line is it's important to have some conversation and model about this uh, alive in your boardrooms. So um, Maryland's work really works work, work with Abraham Maslow. And it's a, um, it's, a, it's a helpful model to think about our current members and potential members. Um, and I think most people have seen this, you know, uh, with the physiological needs at the bottom of the pyramid, and as we move up, we we go from real concrete uh, issues to a bit more abstract. Um, you know, the physiological needs at the bottom: hunger, thirst, and if those needs are need, we're met. We're allowed to work on our security and pro uh, protection, on a sense of belonging and love, and and uh, uh, I, I'd imagine the Buddha would be sitting up on, on the top of this pyramid, all self-actualized. So if you think about our, our membership and, and uh, what all these people that belong to our organizations are, are trying to do, at one level we could think um, we've got members that are really meeting basic food needs. And, and that's one of the reasons that our co-ops were originally uh, uh, created, if you go all the way back to to the Rushdale pioneers is how do we get real food? And at an, another level, we have people uh, that join our clubs for very philosophic reasons. I think uh, uh, regarding world peace or the democratization of capital or building local economies or, or and then in the middle, there's this this layer that it's a, it's a social gathering. And, and I think you can think about the life cycle of organizations and how uh, at some point, I often see in startups that social component is so important. I mean, we're, we're trying to change the world and we're coming together and, and being together. But we have, but the point being that we have members at all of these these places. And if we, so if we think about it more concretely, we've got customers that um, aren't members, but they support the economic vitality of our stores. Uh, and then we've got uh, shopping members. Um, those people that shop in our stores and, and are members of our organization, those uh, social members that uh, go beyond that, they'll come to events, they'll, they'll be engaged, they, they might vote for who, who, who uh, the, the, the band at the, at the member picnic or, or something, and those social connections are very important. And then um, member owners that follow things uh, much closer, and then our active owners. And, and I think it's an important to recognize um, that largely the people on our board are going to come from that active owner's uh, box. And um, but people have a whole range of motivations uh, down this, this scale. And the active owner's perceptions of what's important can be very different than those people uh, lower down the, the uh, hierarchy of needs. So we've got to, I think, always be guarding ourselves against or bringing in the voices and concerns of those people in other uh, places on, on this spectrum. Uh, Mike, Michael, anything Mike, you'd like to ask? Well, yes. Yeah, I was going to jump in here because there's a couple um, questions that are showing up. And also, I just, I think it, um, this is, this is a, a concept that uh, has really, um, Marilyn's insight here has really uh, worked for me on a lot of different levels. And, and what I realize, as, even as you were speaking, um, and, in Marilyn's article, what, what, she, what she doesn't try to necessarily say this is, this is Maslow's theory, but she said that was kind of her jumping off place, where, where that, the idea that um, people have, of course, you know, Maslow's idea of, of human self-actualization isn't the only way to think about people, um, but she said that was that was an inspiration to say maybe the same concept uh, is at least partly true uh, in our food co-ops. Um, 
I recently heard, uh, gosh, I wish I could remember who said this, what I thought was a very wise thing, but um, basically, you know, all, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And so this is um, not exactly the way everything works. Like David is, has a comment that he, in his view, um, social members uh, should be above member owners. And I think it would, you know, just help to go back and read Marilyn's explanation of what she means when she says these different things. And again, not to try to put too much weight in this and say this is exactly how everything works. But it's a useful model. It helps us as we're building a framework for how boards can link with members, this particular model is very useful. It helps us start to understand and see that members, owners, shoppers, users of the co-op, they have a variety of needs and motivations and desires for being linked and how to be linked. And so what we're going to keep doing is building on this, this model, again, not because it's right, but because it's useful, that it's, it's a, it helps boards think about, helps us as leaders think about how do we connect with people. This, that's the, the essence of this workshop. Um, so I, I want people to just keep that in the back of our minds that um, we aren't trying to say this is the only way to think about ownership or that this is the right way, this is, this is the right model of co-op uh, participation, but just it's a useful model. It can help us do the work that we're trying to do. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. So, um, excuse me. Um, can you, real quick, Bentley, there's a question. Can you explain the difference between um, how you see it, the difference between a shopping member and a member owner? Oh. You know, I have my I, own sense, but Mark, do you yeah. have a, a sense? Yeah, well, I, I recall from the way it was written up in the, in the article. Um, so, shopping members are basically uh, uh, members who really their only participation in the co-op is shopping and, and their members. So they're, the, the, the customers are people who are shopping but not members. The shopping members are people who are shopping who are members. And that's their, that is their interaction with the co-op, but that makes them happy just to be there shopping. The social members, uh, like Bentley's uh, example of, of the, that they would vote for the band at the picnic but not the uh, board of directors, this is a group, and again, this is kind of you know from from the article um, that really is uh, involved in the co-op because of the social connectedness. The member owner category is described as the group of members that really see that their member paid in equity forms the capital base for the organization. That they understand that their share is the, is the owner's stake, and they see that economic relationship at the at the ownership level, obviously, in addition to you know the shopping level, so that's the the big distinction that that group has is that they're you know they, they can see the capital connection, and then the active owners are the you know are the board members and people who serve on committee and people who get involved in in various um, you know aspects of the organization, and again. Uh, what's cool is that you get to move around. Like before I joined the board in Brattleboro, I was just a shopping member. <laughs> and someone said, hey, Mark, uh, we serve on the board, and overnight he became an active owner. <laughs> right? So, and someone I was just talking to about this said, uh, yeah, and they were really looking forward to just being a shopping, uh, shopping member again. <laughs> uh -huh. Or I guess maybe going to a member owner, because they were also doing a uh, member loan, for example. Uh-huh. So that's, I think, what you're saying, Mark, too, is that we don't necessarily have to see this as a, as a linear step-by-step -step process. People don't have to move in a line through the process, but that these are just different levels of engagement. And yeah. each of us, as co-op members or as customers, choose the level that we want to be at. And I think that's where, Bentley, you're going to lead us. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think we can recognize that, that people come to organizations that all at all different levels on that on that continuum, and they move around. Um, but as a board, it's important to connect with people at the level of involvement they've chosen to be at, um, and, to, and think about when we're communicating and the activities that not everyone is interested in all things. Um, some people love to come to meetings and come to share their ideas, and other people are much more introverted and prefer prefer not to. Um, so it's a kind of respect for people, taking people where they are, 
um, and at the board level, trying to incorporate the perspectives of people based on their, their, their choice. Um, yeah, we, we, we want to meet them where they are. Uh, and really be thanking every everyone, try and bring as little judgment to this as, as possible. I mean, there's often frustration that, that people aren't doing something more than they're doing. Um, but I think just shopping in the store is, is a critical component of our organization. Um, and if we can provide opportunities for people to move up that scale to meet their, ba their more basic needs so we can involve them more uh, deeply. And it's, uh, good work of the, the board to, to, to deepen, bro broaden the understanding of what these member uh, needs and motivations are. Hey, hey, Bentley, I just want to make a quick, um, there's a comment that one of our listeners is having trouble understanding. Maybe it's the lo location of the microphone or something, so you can just try moving things around a little bit. See oh, if it clear, okay. Clears up. Thank you, Michael. Hey, and yeah. thanks for the comment there. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot to be learned um, by observing and listening to our members deeply. So, so back to that question of, of David's per perceived. Um, you know, what if what if certain members perceive us this way? To to drill into that and think about well, how do we listen to that deeply? What are they trying to say, and what are the needs they're trying to be met? And I think that's where Marilyn's uh, Marilyn's work can be helpful. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So, so, Michael, can you tell us a little bit or share some of uh, this work of Fairbairns? Yeah, so this is, um, I, I've really enjoyed this this collaboration with Mark and Bentley on this, putting together this workshop, um, because I think as we were doing it and we talked about it, we started to see connections between these two um, very experienced, very um, insightful co-op thinkers. So Marilyn Scholl, who is you know, part of our CDS Consulting Co-op, um, has just put a lot of thought into many aspects of co-ops and that, that um, model of the levels of member engagement uh, really speaks to me in many ways. Um, I, I understand that in a, as a very helpful tool. And then um, actually it was uh, Bob Noble actually who's, who's uh, on tonight's uh, session also who first introduced me to Brett Fairbairn. Um, so this was uh, um, someone that uh, you know, Bob had learned about and said, hey, have you read this article, The Three Strategic Concepts? Um, and he sent that to me. And the first time I read it, I thought, well, OK, that's interesting. But it didn't stick with me. And then other folks started um, suggesting it to me. And what I started to recognize is that uh, Brett Fairbairn is also a very insightful uh, person when it comes to co-ops. And he, his model, his, his idea is that um, for co-ops to be successful, we, uh, he, he talks about the co-op needs to do certain things. And when I hear him say that, what I hear is the co-op's leaders need to do certain things. And so the co-op itself doesn't actually do anything unless the people involved are making it happen. That's those active owners. And so um, the idea is that uh, these three we can think about the relationship that owners have to their co-op in three ways. The first is this economic linkage, the second is transparency, and the third is cognition. And so what we're going to do is take a few minutes to just quickly overview um, Fairbairn's ideas and then put those ideas together with Marilyn's ideas to lead into, based on these two models, um, can we then think about specifically what does a board do to engage members? Um, so this is a question that uh, one of our listeners just put in here, right? What's the practical application? So what we're doing here in this workshop is we're first going to lay out sort of a, a theoretical grounding, and then we're going to get into some very practical tools um, that boards can use and explain why those make sense because of this theory. So um, we're going to move on real quick to the economic linkage here. Um, if you can push us along there, Bentley. Thanks. Um, so what Fairbairn says is that Co-ops are businesses that are organized to help members meet their economic needs. That's, that's what co-ops are. And so while our, our food co-ops as they exist might have been created, might have started for a lot of different reasons, in essence, there's this economic need. How do we get the food that we want to eat? Um, and so that, uh, remember in Maryland's model, that people 
first, foremost, primarily interact with their co-op as customers. That if the, if the co-op isn't meeting my needs as a customer, what would be my motivation to do anything else in the co-op? Well, there probably wouldn't be. Why would I want to be a member of something that doesn't actually meet my needs? And so Fabian says, remember that this economic linkage is a primary part of the relationship. And so one of the things that we're going to talk about in a little bit is how do boards look at that relationship? How do we understand how members are connected to their co-op through the economics, um, are using the co-op, shopping at the co-op? That's what members do in, in their act of participation economically. Um, and on the reverse side of that, what Fairbairn says is, remember that um, a, a successful business makes a profit and that when boards, when the leadership of the co-op um, returns in a responsible way, returns some of that profit to members in the, in the form of a dividend, that's a clear connection to members that they are owners of the business, that the business was profitable, and the business was profitable because they supported the co-op. The thing that's the beautiful about patronage dividends, it's part of the principles that the Rochdale pioneers figured out is that we co-op owners get dividends in relation to how much we patronize the co-op, how much we support the business, how much we use the business, not how much we've invested in the business. And so this is a very critical part of the economic linkage that Fairbairn talks about. So the next uh, slide is, and again, we're going to only touch on these a little bit just to give a background for the other stuff we're talking about. Fairbairn's article is much more uh, detailed, of course. So the second part of the relationship uh, that, um, or the, the, the strategic concepts that Fairbairn talks about is this idea of transparency. So it's not enough, he says, that, that the co-op acts in the best interest of, of members, of owners, but it's essential that the members see that the co-op acts in their best interest and in the interest of others. Now, the word transparency gets used in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, people talk about transparency in government and open meetings and things like that. Fairbairn's use of transparency is, is quite a bit different than that. So it's not that people can show up to meetings. That's not what he says transparency is. It's not that they get to read the minutes of the board meeting. That's not what he's talking about. In his view, transparency is that members can see inside the business. They can understand the, the various pushes and pulls of the economics within the business. Why does food cost what it costs? Who's getting that money? What does it take to pay employees? Um, what does it take to buy the food and pay fair prices to farmers? To be able to see that part of the business. Um, also that, he, that members can see through the co-op that they own and see what's going on in the broader world, the, the industry in which we operate. So for all of us who are part of the natural foods co-op universe, there's a whole world around us about food and food distribution and food systems and local food and organic food. and Fairbairn says, remember that that's important for, mem for, for our owners, for our members to see, that, that, that we can see that we're operating within a, a vaster universe than what's going on just in our own uh, backyard here. And then the third uh, strategic concept on the next slide is about um, cognition. And what Fairbairn says, cognition, you know, what, what do we know? What, how do we understand? together. And I loved his phrase that cognition was the glue that keeps the co-op and his members together when both are changing. So back to that, that uh, conversation that Mark, you initiated, change happens. Right? The, the world that we live in today is not the world that the founders of our co-ops lived in. Even if, if this is a startup co-op and was, was working, people were starting just in the last few months or a year ago, the world continues to change. For, for some co-ops that were uh, still around from the Depression era. You know the world has changed for most of us where our co-ops started up in the early 70s. This is a vastly different world here in the uh, you know, last part of this first decade of the 2000s than it was in 1970. And what keeps us all together is this some shared understanding we have about who we are, what, what difference we're making in the world, why are we together. And uh, one of the things that I really appreciate is how in the, uh, the policy governance model we're, we're uh, encouraged to really pay attention to what are our values, 
what are the outcomes we're trying to achieve together and to articulate those in our ends policies. Um, and if you're not using a policy governance model, you might still have a, a mission statement. Right? This, is, this is our identity, a statement of who we are. And so the, the co-op leaders, then it's, it's our job as the small group of committed citizens to make sure that we are sharing this, this common identity, that we are putting this out to folks and reminding each other that, hey, this is who we are. And changing that statement of identity over time as the world changes. Right? We, the, the statement of identity that worked for our co-op 35 years ago may not be the one that works for us today because the world is different. And so there's a slow, constant evolution of identifying ourselves and making sure that our owners understand that common identity. So in, in Fairbairn's article, he really puts um, some effort into helping us realize that the leadership of the co-op must articulate our shared identity and must then communicate that out to the owners. Um, and then listen back. Bentley, you talk about listening deeply. We've got to be able to listen back. We've got to find ways of listening to find out if we got it right. Did, we, th did what we articulate, did that, did that resonate with our community, with our owners? So um, that's a, a quick, quick uh, overview of Fairbairn's ideas. And then what I want to do is just take a quick second to um, tie these two models together. Now remember, you know, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And these two, when we put them together, turn out to be really useful in helping boards, co-op leaders, think about engaging with our members. So in Marilyn's uh, pyramidal structure there, she reminds us, she, she shows for us that members have different needs, different motivations. And so as leaders, one of the things that we can do is not try to change who people are, not try to make them be like us, not try to make them show up to meetings, but we can engage them. There are ways that we can link with them, that we can connect with them wherever they are, and that we can make sure that they um, at least, whether they're motivated or not, that there are at least avenues, that there are, there are, there are possibilities open to them um, that they might be motivated for changing their level of involvement, maybe increasing their level of involvement, when we as leaders pay attention to those economic linkages, when we make sure that we are being transparent, again, in that sense of making sure our owners understand that the co-op really is working to benefit them and others. So we're going we're gonna to spend a few minutes uh, this evening talking about how does a board, how does a, the leadership of the co-op tell a compelling and relevant story? If the story we're telling is compelling and relevant, then it will resonate with our, with our members, with our community, and people will be involved with our co-op and will en be engaged, which is what we're talking about. How do we engage our members where they are? Um, I, I love the cartoon that you found here, Bentley. Um, uh, the the uh, you know dog finally found somebody who's who's speaking to him where he is uh, now if where your members want to be is chasing the ball and barking um, and then we can say that then maybe the next thing we'll say is uh, we'll teach them to sit and roll over right we can we can move members along if they're willing and able uh, for that kind of movement so what we're going to get into is um, now we're going to get into some of those practical tools so Genevieve your your question really is the the question of the evening. What is it that we can actually do? And so what we're going to now get into is um, what is it that co-ops uh, have in place already? By the very design of our co-ops, we have systems in place that help us engage. Um, part of our goal, Bentley, Mark, and I, as we were talking about this, we were recognizing how many times we are talking to directors and boards who have um, some sense that we're supposed to be doing something more, that there's something we're missing. And so we're trying to create new tools. We're trying to um, create a new system. We're trying to make a special event of some sort because we're feeling uh, that there's this constant sense of unrequited love. Right? There's the board members that want to engage and the co-op members who want to go shopping or want to go uh, coach their little league team or want to go to the beach or want to raise their kids or whatever else is they're doing. And what we want to get into now is uh, a recognition of the very structure of co-ops and how that helps us actually be engaged with our members wherever they are. 
So the, the four primary systems we're going to talk about are, first off, the democratic system. Co-ops are democratic organizations. It's one of the fundamental cooperative principles. Um, second, we're going to look at how much information we already can glean or have gleaned about what our members are doing. So rather than trying to um, create new tools for gauging what members are doing or what they want, um, we're going to show how there's some practical uh, bits of information that already exist in our co-ops that tell us a lot, a lot about our members and their, uh, what their desires and motivations are. Third, we're going to get into some of the existing uh, communication tools that, mem that boards, the leaders of the co-op have, to communicate out to members and to hear back. Uh, and we're going to look at some of the events that are built into co-op structure. So we're moving on now to a little bit about democracy. Um, this, of course, could take a whole lifetime. Um, and before I get too far into it, I just want to check, um, Bentley or Mark, anything else you wanted to emphasize about either the, the pyramidal levels of member involvement in, engagement or Fairbairn's three strategic concepts before we get into the, the specific tools? Michael, I think that the point I'll make on that will um, fit in nicely later, so okay. we can take it up then. Okay. No, I think it's great, Mike. We're, we're still good to go? Great. Good to go. All right. Um, so here's one that, that uh, I, I know many of the boards that I work with, um, if, if they don't struggle with this, that they're often recognizing that hmm, there's something up here that sometimes we don't have enough members, enough people running for the open seats, or we're having trouble uh, recruiting people um, to the board. And that is that is a true dilemma. You know, that's something that's that's hard to figure out. Um, but in in the world of co-ops, if we want to talk about how our boards engaged, uh, well, more than almost any other kind of organization. Boards are engaged because we directors are chosen by our members to do the work that we're doing. Remember that that uh, graphic that Mark showed of the um, uh, what was it called? The member the member cycle. The, the name. Yeah, empowerment and accountability. Thank, empowerment and accountability. Thank you, Mark. Um, so that members, as Mark said, have asked us to do this work, and they're asking us through a democratic process. So one of the things that we can recognize is, by the very nature of being a democratically elected group, we are engaged with our members, that they are engaged with us. If that's true, and, and we do see the importance of this, then one of the things that boards will do to make sure that we're even better engaged with our members is we'll make sure that we are presenting a range uh, of qualified candidates to our members to choose from. Because if there's three open seats and we offer three people to fill those seats and the members dutifully vote for those three, well, I guess that's an exercise in democracy, but we're always left with that lingering question of, are these the, the best people for the job? Um, are, are, are these really the people who are able to speak on behalf of the members? And uh, Marilyn and I did a, a, one of these online workshops. If you haven't uh, checked it out, you may want to go back to our Seabill library about board perpetuation. And we gave some real practical ideas about how boards can build up a pool of candidates so that every time there's an election, you have more than enough candidates from which members can choose. And if they're all qualified, for being a director, then anyone that the member chooses will be fine. But what will happen is then the members are actually choosing the folks that we might not, our, as leaders ourselves, we might not know um, who the best choice is. So we put it out to our owners, and they get to choose. So choosing your own leaders, that's an important part of being engaged, of being connected. And so the democratic structure of co-ops is just ideal for that. That's, that's what it's made for. Um, hey, so Mike, Michael, let me, let me just interrupt for a second and oh, give a plug. That, that recorded workshop um, that's in the library is really worth um, watching and listening to. There was a great conversation on this idea of building qualified candidate pool. Highly recommend it. Hey, thanks for the plug, Mark. I liked it, too. Um, OK, so on to the next slide real quick. Um, so there it is again, the, the empowerment and accountability flow. So again, members are empowering the board, who in turn empowers the management. Um, and the board is then in turn accountable to the membership. Um, so uh, 
what we want to do is just we're, we're putting this in front of everyone again, just to remind you, this is what we're talking about, that the mem this, this actually, this diagram came from a really wonderful article that Bill Gessner wrote a number of years ago in Cooperative Grocer, um, the Cooperative Empowerment Stream, he called it, and it was a really nicely thought out um, understanding uh, presentation of this idea of empowerment within co-ops. I encourage anyone to go back and read that article if you haven't yet. Um, uh, just real quick, I want to go back to uh, this question about the seminar about uh, candidates. Um, it was a, it's in the C-Build library online, um, and it was, I think we called it board perpetuation. Um, so you should be able to go and find that in the library. Um, okay, so on to the next slide there. Mr. Bitley, if you don't mind. So how do we... Given that the, the board is in a position of, through a democratic election, being empowered by the members to act on their behalf, to be, to, to be fiduciaries, to make decisions on behalf of the whole, we could stop right there and we could just say, hey, you know, they elected us, we're empowered, we're just going to do it. Um, but I've never run across a co-op director anyway um, who feels like that's enough. And I'm glad because because one of the things I really love about our co-ops is that we're we're working very hard uh, as directors, as leaders, to act on behalf of the of the members. And the question comes up all all the time: Well, how do we know what they really want? How do we know if what we're deciding is what makes sense? And uh, actually, in a board meeting I was recently at, someone one of the directors pointed at the the ends policy of the board and said, "Well." okay, so we made this up, how do we know that's what the members want? And that question is a very powerful question. And one of the things that we're going to uh, encourage uh, you all to think about tonight is that asking someone what they want might get you an answer. Um, but one of the things that we, we know in the world is that people also speak with their actions. And so rather than uh, asking the, the, the question out loud, what do you want? Um, are you part of this? Are these values your values? Are we speaking for you? It's actually built into the way food co-op businesses um, keep track of stuff that we can, we can get a pretty good guess of our people with us. Have we, have, are we speaking on their behalf? Um, so one of the things you might look at as a board, some very powerful information about uh, your members are are those trends in membership? Is the membership base growing? Are, are people who were customers, are they choosing to become shopping members? Right? Are they investing equity? So is equity increasing? Are the membership numbers increasing? If those things are true, that's a pretty good gauge. right? It's not perfect yet, but it's, that gives us a sense that, hey, this is working for people. What we're saying is making sense, that they're joining, they want to join what we've said we're doing here. Um, if people who have already joined are also increasing their equity over time or are paying the full amount of the fair share, um, those are very important indicators that folks are with us, that, that what we're doing really speaks to them. Um, buying patterns, we suggest this as uh, just something a little harder kind of data to keep track of, but um, of our members, are most of them doing most of their shopping at the co-op, is the co-op really meeting their needs for food? Or are most of our members actually doing the bulk of their shopping somewhere else um, And because the co-op doesn't actually meet their needs for food? That one's not readily available, um, but we think that would be a really interesting kind of data to, to pay attention to. Um, I had this conversation with a board last fall uh, who was having this question. They were, they were thinking about um, doing an expansion and would, would need a member loan campaign. And they, they again, have this question of, well, how do we know if it's what people want? I said, well, one indicator is, um, beyond all the, the meetings you're going to have ahead of time, if you start a member loan campaign but nobody contributes any money to that loan, no one wants to actually loan you any money, that's a good indicator that, whoops, you're on the wrong track. You, you've made the wrong decision or that you haven't communicated that decision well. Um, but if people are investing loans, are, are, are offering to share some of their own personal wealth with the co-op um, because they believe in what the co-op is doing, that's a good indicator that what you're doing, what you've said for, for members makes sense. Meeting participation, um, as in annual meetings, um, 
if, if your co-op has two or three people that show up to annual meetings every year, um, well, maybe it's because you have a really boring annual meeting, um, but maybe it's also because folks aren't engaged with the co-op. There's only a few co-ops that I've heard of that have hundreds, many hundreds of people that will show up to, to member meetings. Um, but uh, I know that my own hometown co-op went from uh, a pretty typical annual meeting of half a dozen people showing up to now a pretty typical annual meeting of 150 people showing up. There's a, there's a much closer, clearer member engagement going on there. So that kind of information um, can be helpful to boards. Um, there's this um, question here about uh, the, the small number of people who actually vote for uh, directors and uh, the small pool of candidates. And again, um, this, this is a constant concern for directors, and it's a good thing to be concerned about in the sense of paying attention to it. Um, but what we're trying to uh, explain, or at least suggest in this uh, workshop tonight, is that the, just because someone isn't voting in the election doesn't mean they're not engaged in their co-op. It means they're engaged at a different level, that they're engaged maybe as a shopping member, or they're engaged maybe as a social member. So voting for office or running for office is not the only or even the best indicator of engagement. It is an indicator. It is one indicator. Um, and so with all these indicators, we're suggesting you, you collect the information, you pay attention to it, and then you have to use your judgment. If, if all your indicators indicate that uh, nobody, your membership is not connected at any level, well, I, I think then as a, as a co-op leader I'd be really concerned and I'd want to know what we're going to do different about that. Um, but people who don't, um, who don't vote in elections, um, you know, again, personally, I, I, I feel like it, it doesn't make sense to put tons of effort into just making people sh vote in the election um, when there might actually be other ways to engage members that are more... Um, more uh, closely aligned to their own sense <coughs> of connection to their co-op. And if, the, if you, we can connect to people where they are, then maybe over time they will want to engage at other levels. I don't know, did, did um, Mark or Bentley, do you want to have any other sense of uh, that question there about the number of candidates? I, it, it actually, uh, well, Bentley, why don't you, uh, if you have a comment, because uh, my comment will segue into the next, uh, into the next bit, really. Yeah, I, I, I think if we look at the whole package where, where, our, where our board members are, are, are working on relevant and compelling questions of our day, uh, they're adding value to the organization. Uh, we're sharing that, which we're really going to get into in the next slide, that we're sharing that compelling story. We're informing uh, members. We have information going out um, of our organizations. People are seeing the difference we make in the world. That, that can be a way to increase participation, desires to be on the board, desires to be engaged, opportunities to move up that hierarchy. But as Michael said, it's, it's not uh, critical e either. I don't think it's the, the sign that we should take that, that uh, it, it's one data point. If we're seeing more and more people join our organizations, if we're seeing dynamic sales trends, those are other ways to judge the health. Um, but of, of, of course, we'd always prefer more people to vote. Uh, we'd prefer more people to be informed, to be engaged. Um, but yeah, Mark, Mark, anything to add? Oh, maybe, oh, go ahead. You go ahead, Michael. Well, I was going to say, maybe if we go to the next couple slides, um, again, the, thinking of practical tools, um, because I don't want to give the impression that I'm encouraging, and I don't think Bentley and Mark, the three of us, are encouraging boards to be complacent, just to say, okay, you know, we just sit back and people will engage at whatever level they want to engage, and that's fine. On one, in one sense, that is fine, and we need to honor people at whatever level they are. But on the other sense, as leaders of the co-op, we're always going to be putting out effort to make sure that folks can learn more at whatever moment they want to learn more, that folks can engage more at whatever moment they want to engage more. We don't want to do anything that shuts off the possibility that people could be more engaged with their co-op, that they could be more connected to their co-op. And so, um, again, we, we, on the one hand, 
wherever folks are is fine. We need to honor them. We need to appreciate their level of participation. If all they're doing is shopping and investing uh, equity, that's a tremendous benefit to the business, to our co-op, and we want to we want to really appreciate that. Um, I think I heard Marilyn say once, uh, you know, if someone comes into the store and and uh, buys a um, you know goes buys a, uh, a head of lettuce and then leaves, we don't run chasing them down the street and saying, hey, how come you didn't go buy something more? Why'd you only buy a head of lettuce? We say, thank you, come again. We honor people where they are as shoppers, and I think it's important to also think about honoring people where they are as members. So given that, we, we say thank you for whatever level of participation you are engaged in, but we also then want to put out information as leaders back to Fairbairn's idea of we want to make sure we're, we're increasing transparency and cognition. What are the tools that, that, that co-ops have? When I travel around the country, one of the first things I look for in a, in a um, co-op, I go into a store and I look for the newsletter. Now, I know that I'm kind of nerdy in that way and not everyone wants to read a newsletter, but that's one of the tools that co-ops have of engaging with people who want to read something. Websites, some co-ops are starting blogs or e-newsletters. E There's a variety of sort of the written communication in whatever form it is that the, the co-op leadership can use. Using the tool is one thing. Saying something that really matters is another thing, right? What is it that we're actually trying to say through this tool? But um, we're going to be trying to use the tools we have to tell our compelling and relevant story. Um, the annual report is another one. I was actually uh, having a conversation with the GM today about uh, annual reports. He was really inspired by the workshop at CCMA that the Seward folks put on um, and thinking about how do we communicate this wonderful information to our membership. The annual report. M most co-ops that I work with anyway put out some form of an annual report. Rather than it being just a, a dry presentation of financial information, it can also be something even more. It can tell the, the compelling and relevant story. Back to Fairbairn's idea of the economic linkage. The patronage refunds are a very powerful communication tool. Again, it reminds us as owners that, hey, your, your patronage of this business helped us succeed. Thank you very much. Now, last year, my co-op gave out our, for the first time ever, patronage refund uh, distributions. And uh, I got my, my check in the mail, and I said, woohoo, I'm psyched. You know, I, I got myself some money back. Um, but there was also the letter with it that said, here's why you're getting this money back. Right? Here's, here's what this is, this is about. It was a chance for the co-op leadership to remind me that this happened because the co-op succeeded, and the co-op succeeded because I patronized the co-op. So with, with any of these tools that we're using, um, just putting out the question, saying to, to our members, what do you think or what do you want or what do you believe, um, might not give, get us nearly as much um, easily accessible and powerful and useful, usable information as if we put out uh, the compelling and relevant story, sharing, articulating over and over again, these are the common values that, that we understand, this is as the, as the empowered subset of members, this is what the board has put out, um, we're going to make sure we describe the benefits, and, and actually when I say board and leader, I'm often mixing up in my own mind what, the, what, the, what might happen through the operations, through the manager's leadership, and what might happen from the board's leadership. Um, those details don't matter to me nearly as much as that the leadership of the co-op is putting out this kind of information. That we're making sure that people understand we have come from somewhere. Change has happened. Change will continue to happen. And here's where we are right now on that continuum of change. Um, so we're going to be thinking carefully, strategically, about what is it we're trying to communicate? Who are we communicating to? What is it we want them to hear from us right, as the leaders? What is it we're trying to say? And always, with whatever we say, we will always ask people to tell us what you think about it. Right? Here's, here's what we're putting out in our article. Here's what we're putting out in our annual report. And please, feel free to email us. Feel free to tra trap us in the aisles. Feel free to put a note in the suggestion box. Um, feel free to come to a board meeting and speak to us if you want. So we're always putting out the invitation for people to respond. But the critical piece is that we're actually giving them something real, something valuable to respond to. It's not just an open-ended question of what do you think. It's what do you think about this? Um, here's, a, here's a question. Um, what do you mean by strategic? Like, so in being strategic, so I, I 
use my own little language there to, to, to explain how I thought about strategic. But Mark or Bentley, do you have another way of, of explaining to a director what, what would it mean to be strategic in this kind of work? Well, um, the way the way I think about it is um, is not uh, n number one. I, I try not to go to the program level, but I try to go upstream into what's happening in the world that is affecting our members and our community, and what questions can we ask about what we see when we look there to help us have an inquiry about what is changing and what are the dynamics in play and how are these um, how are these factors uh, impacting uh, not only our members now and our community now but how do we see the trends changing and affecting our members and our community differently in, in next year and in five years and in ten years and to me that's the that's the real strategic leadership position that the board um, can can be in. So it's really looking in the right direction and doing your best at framing questions that get you into the body of work um, at a strategic level to be really looking at trends. Nice. Yeah, so, so the idea that the, the board has a strategy, that the board is thinking about what are we doing and why we're doing it. There's something we're actually trying to accomplish, which is different than um, the, the commonly used term of you know, strategic planning as an operation, that's an operational thing, right? what the, the strategic planning that goes on operationally. But that boards themselves might do some strategic planning about the board's work and about what we're trying to accomplish. Nice. Let's, let's move up. Go ahead. I can think of also in terms of being strategic and in in, in thinking about all the ways people are involved in our co-op and providing messages to them. them. Mike, Mike, you talked about news, newsletters. You talked, you know, we have our events. That we're, that we're sequencing our activities to prepare to answer questions and that we're being strategic about informing them about our activities. That we're bringing consciousness to our actions. Yeah, nice. Now, earlier, um, we'll, let's go on to the next slide and just one last set of, of tools that boards can use. In this case, it's the interactive events. And again, these are built into um, how most co-ops function and structure. Um, and uh, David earlier wrote in a question about uh, recognizing you know, what, what his board has done when they updated their own ends and then what they did or didn't do in terms of putting that that work, that thought, that those ideas out to their community of members. And so here's another set of places where boards can do that, where boards can communicate what they've done, how that, what they've said on behalf of the owners. So in the other uh, previous slide about newsletters, um, reports, those tend to be one-way communication. It's a written form of communication. We're putting something out to people. But here now we also have in, in co-ops, almost always co-ops have annual meetings. Um, some co-ops have uh, a couple of these a year. Um, and this is a chance where um, the board, the leadership of the co-op can use it as an opportunity to, again, think about our strategy. What's important to us right now? What is it that we most want to make sure our, our owners are hearing? The folks who are showing up at that member meeting are probably out of that group of social members and and member owners and active members, right? They're going to be at that level of the that, that pyramid of engagement. Um, and so what is it we want to say to people in that context um, who are already engaged at that level? The other thing that happens is sometimes a board might want a special meeting to talk to members. Now, I've, I've witnessed a number of boards try to create um, uh, what I, what I, for shorthand, refer to as uh, you know breakfast with the board, some sort of social event where we say, okay, let's let's you know we'll just have a time here where people can show up and talk to us. And while not universally true, what I tend to see, and I think that what Bentley and Mark and I, the three of us, are recognizing together, those often tend to be kind of duds of events that that the board ends up not getting what they thought they wanted to get out of it. And the piece that we think is missing that's critical there is that they aren't. The board doesn't actually have a specific 
topic that they're trying to figure out, nor a real need for specific input from members. And so they're just kind of open-ended. They're not directed. And what we're saying is these meetings can be really valuable, but not just for the sake of having a meeting, but it's because we're really working on something, that as a board we're trying to figure something out here. There's a big question we're grappling with. And here's a point, here's a place where we're really looking for more input. Now remember in that empowerment stream, um, when members elect the board, one of the things that they're saying is, we're really happy for you all to go to a lot of meetings um, and act on our behalf. And because if you do that, then we can go do something else that's important to us. Again, raising our children, having a job, uh, going, going to coach a team, uh, leading a Girl Scout troop, whatever it is we're doing. But sometimes a meeting about big topics makes sense. Mark wrote a really excellent article a number of years ago in Cooperative Grocer about uh, his work on the board of Brattleboro Food Co-op when they were thinking about uh, relocating their co-op. It was a big decision. And when, when they engaged with their members about it, as a board, they really learned some valuable information that they hadn't learned or thought about beforehand. So again, we want to put out that these kinds of meetings can be really valuable, important but not just for the sake of having a meeting, not just for the sake of getting people to show up, but it's because the board has real work that they're trying to figure out, and this is a time where they need some input. Um, another social uh, interactive event are just social events. Um, you know, there was a co-op that I was working with recently where uh, they were going to put on a, a, a dance and just have people come and celebrate together just to, to share community. Uh, and, uh, when I was sitting in a board meeting, a couple of board members said, well, this is, you know, this is silly. We shouldn't be doing stuff like that. That's not what this is about. We should be having a real meeting where we're talking about real issues. And other folks were advocating for saying, but hey, part of why people are part of our co-op is for that social engagement, for that sense of community. And so why would we not want to have some sort of event that allows for that? Now, there's a fair chance that um, the board is probably not the right group to plan a social event, but that the, the, through the manager, through the operations, you might have those kinds of dances and things like that. And that's a way for members to engage in their co-op. It's a very valuable way, um, and it might encourage people who are engaged at that social level to say, hey, this is really fun, this is really neat. I wonder what other opportunities there are for me to engage with my co-op. So the, the idea with these events is we aren't creating them just for the sake of creating them. We aren't creating them just so we can have people do more stuff at the co-op. Because if we're doing that, then we are not honoring that people are engaged at the level they want to be engaged at. So it's not our job isn't to try to make them do more than what they're already doing. But that we do want to make sure there are opportunities for people to engage at higher levels if they choose to or at other levels. And as Mark mentioned, sometimes people choose to engage at a uh, lower level on the pyramid, and that works for them too, and we need to honor that. So we're going to have these events. Um, they, they exist. Co-ops do these things, the, the, the social events, the annual meetings. Um, these are very important member engagement events. Um, so anything on that before we quickly segue on to the next uh, slide? Bentley or Mark? I'm good. Got any questions in the audience that we want to get out here? It's kind of quiet right at this moment. Yeah. So maybe we can just keep on cruising. Yeah. Okay. I um, I'm struck in in, uh, in in listening and participating in this workshop uh, again. Uh, for, uh, for those of you who weren't at CCMA, we we presented this there, and and um, I'm thinking about this question: Is the board in a leadership position, and you know, it's a high bar. I think I think a board has to have a lot of things uh, figured out in order to actually be leading. And we work with a lot of boards, and and there are you know lots of moving parts and group dynamics and being accountable for everything that goes on and all that and. I think this idea of putting engagement on top of being in a leadership position is uh, is great because it's 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 simple, it's straightforward, and yet it's also very demanding about what a board is actually doing. Because we're saying what I'm hearing Michael and Bentley say is that um, being in a leadership position. <laughs> 
be strategic. Oh, let's explore what it means to be strategic. That's a great question. What does it mean? And a board could grapple with that and ought to be able to come up with um, a really compelling answer that will then lead the board into a direction that will be worth telling members about. Um, kind of rewinding all the way back to um, Michael's description of Fairbairn's uh, linkage, transparency, and cognition. I really liked how uh, that idea of transparency came through as um, uh, being able to exhibit, really, that the board is thinking about stuff. It's a way of telling uh, the compelling and relevant story. So these questions are really meant to um, help a board figure out, are we, are we in the zone? Can we be thinking? Are we studying and learning about stuff? And I mean, we're so lucky right now because uh, there's so much going on in the world and in our communities that affect our members and our co-op organizations. Um, that you know, we could be really taking a leadership position in that conversation. So this first question, you know, we would encourage you to go back to your board and say, "Gee, are we are we in this position? Are we able to study and learn?" And if we can't because we're we're dealing with group dynamics or we're struggling with how we're being accountable for what's going on in the business or we're dealing with board GM relationship issues. It's like, figure that out sooner than later so that you can do this and then engage members um, at this level. And I want to just a uh, quick plug for, uh, in March, we did a recorded online workshop of um, governing in a recession. And that's in the library. And there's a terrific article in there that uh, Walden Swanson uh, contributed to that talks about this we, me cycle. And I, if, you, if you haven't read that, I really encourage you to go to the library and check that out. Um, and he has this, uh, this great line in there of, of, he says, well, just maybe, you know, if we're in this we cycle, which means that people are actually motivated to be doing things together, they're, they're going to be attracted to basically what co-ops are all about right now. And if he says, look, if, that's a, if we're just in a cycle and that's going to go away some, someday, and there's this window of opportunity, uh, that means that it's not a permanent condition. And you know, I would just add to that in, in relationship to what we're working on today, that member engagement right now and, and, and during this, this, these, these interesting times um, brings with it a certain attractiveness. But I think you do need to be thinking and, and, and learning and asking these uh, strategic questions in order for it to really, you know, happen. Next, are you using those tools that Michael uh, just went through to be public with your inquiry process? It's really not enough for the nine board members or whatever to be talking about uh, strategic concepts and stuff that's going on in the world that affects your members and your community if you're not also sharing that you're doing that. Um, go out there. Be public. Um, maybe even have an event in your community on the topic that you're working on and really say, look, our co-op is about thinking about this idea. We want to understand it. Uh, that is a, is a powerful form of, of leadership. And then this other issue of, you know, look, do we, have, do we feel like we have a connection? Do we have a qualified candidate pool? Do we have active elections? All those things that, that Michael uh, just went through, I think you want to be paying attention to. But you can see in our presentation, we're not saying, hey, go ask what they want. We're saying, you take the position that you can actually be leaders in your organization and be driving a conversation and then be watching and listening. All right? Um, there is that. And if you go to the next slide there, Bentley. Yeah. Anything more? What do you think? What do you think, Bentley? 
I think we've covered a lot of ground. And I, I think it's worth kind of just uh, saying that I think most most co-ops are doing a lot more than they give themselves credit for. I mean, if you if you think of our, our uh, the, the, the heritage of our movement and the heritage of our own stores, uh, it starts with those that group of people thinking and, and uh, thinking about that relevant and compelling question uh, and asking others to join them. And, and that's one of the ways that we can show the link is if people are joining us. Uh, joining us, um, we, we need to be paying a lot, as leaders in our organizations. We need to be paying a lot of attention to what our members are doing and listening very deeply to what they're saying. Um, and we need to say uh, deeply because uh, we've got to be sure that we're not uh, overwhelmed with the loud voices balancing that against the whole pool of our. Uh, our members, and I think it's incredibly important uh, to belabor it, but to work those systems we have. Um, if we don't need to go out and necessarily invent some new way to link with our members. If we can spend our time as a board uh, uh, bringing vibrancy to our election process, um, um, uh, finding the, the most effective ways possible to communicate outward to our members, and then uh, creating doors for our members to communicate in. Um, so we're not locking the doors, and Carol E. talks about, you know, don't don't lock the doors because the angry members will come through the windows. But having means for uh, input uh, to the board so we can be listening to that. Um, and taking advantage of the meetings we have. Um, so t today we talked about all that, and we've tried to lay out a couple of examples or, or, or models from which to think about uh, our, our members, and we hope that's uh, um, useful. Um, but it, in, in all of these cases, it comes down to our boards uh, using a lot of judgment um, and really taking serious that building knowledge and wisdom about all of these questions. Um, Mike, Michael, anything that you'd like to add here at the end? Um, I guess only that when I look at this phrase, most co-ops are doing more than they give themselves credit for, um, what, I, what I really hear out of it and what I hope others hear is, um, again, not that, oh, Bentley, Mark, and Michael said we're all doing more than we need to and we should just chill out here and, and not put out any effort. What I really want to communicate is that we're doing more in the sense that the systems are already there, the, the, the processes are already there, and that what, what we don't need to do is try to figure out a new way of, of running the, the, the co-op world we need to say, let's really, really get good at these basics that are ingrained, that are part of the way our co-op is structured. Let's use those to their fullest. Um, and, I, and I think that paying attention to those things will take our, our group of leaders around the country really, really far. And, the, and along with that, will bring the, the members of the co-op along with us, too. So again, we're, we're, we're moving along as leaders. And as we move forward, we're asking the question, are you still with us? Um, that we can look around and find out if people are with us by using the systems that are here in our co-ops already. And so that the idea of relaxing is just to say, yes, it's important to, to link with our members, but let's not give this some mystical meaning uh, that drives us crazy because we can never achieve it. Um, that what, what we're trying to say is it's a, the meaning is very straightforward, that we are linked in co-ops, and we just have to pay attention to those linkages and make use of them. What a great idea. <laughs> hey, and as, as you tell your story uh, to your members and community, would you please also uh, post those articles to the CGIN board listserv, because others in the country would like to hear what you are doing when you are doing your leadership work. All right, and that's my contribution. Bentley, do you want to close this? Okay. Is there any uh, is there any last questions out there before we close out? We have covered the questions. Thank you all so awesome. much for writing in questions. Okay. Yeah, and thank you, Michael, and thank you, Bentley. And um, I think there is a survey that comes up after we end the session. We appreciate that feedback, and we hope that you. Um, uh, take advantage of the recording to share that with other people on your board um, after it's posted. We'll have it up there in the next day or two in the, in the Seabuild Library. Okay. Thank you both and thank you all. I'll, I'll be closing the session now.
Okay. Good night. Hey, and, uh, hit, hit stop uh, recording and then end session.